Welcome to the India Revival Mission, our special program on ET Now, and I'm Tamanna Enamdar. Today I'm speaking with Mr. Gautam Singhania, MD and Chairman of the Raymond Group, uh, and of course, uh, spearheading a sector which creates a lot of employment but is also facing a lot of headwinds right now from across the world due to the coronavirus pandemic. Uh, Mr. Singhania, welcome to this special program and a pleasure as always to have you on ET Now. Thank you very much. All right, let me start off with, uh, you know, how you see the situation we are in currently. We have seen about four to five months of what a post pandemic or uh, an economy looks like in the middle of a pandemic. A lot of companies have figured out how to survive, revive. Uh, do you see this as a big change in philosophy, even at the Raymond Group? We know that costs have been cut, uh, jobs have been pared down as well. What has been your biggest learning so far? See, we are in the middle of a pandemic and uh... You know, it's a tough time, but you know, this pandemic is here to stay. I don't think it's going away tomorrow. Having said that, I think, you know, people talk about a new normal, people talk about sitting at home, work from home, etc., etc. I think people are just only focusing on the work from home. But what are you going to work if consumption is not going to happen? And consumption will only happen if you open up the markets. Now, a lot of countries in the world did a lockdown for one specific reason. And the reason was that you do the lockdown, you build up your medical infrastructure, and then you let it open up. But to keep it locked down in the state is detrimental to the progress of business. And I'm quite strongly advocating that we have to now open up because I, I completely empathize with the the issues of coronavirus and the deaths due to that, but I don't think anybody is really seeing the actual deaths of businesses, the lacks of people who are losing their livelihood, the places that migrant workers are not finding, and the, and the difficulties that they are being through. So I genuinely believe that, you know, it's now we've been in four or five months lockdown. I think the time has come to open up, and, and that is the only way to recover. Aren't we open, Mr. Singhania? Um, I mean, technically, we are in Unlock 3.0. Uh, we have most uh, states and cities allowing brick and mortar stores to open as well with certain restrictions in containment zones, etc. Uh, has that not helped in any way? Well, you know, technically is the correct word you use. Technically, we are open, but are we actually open? We are opening in fits and starts. We are going back into lockdowns as and when we feel like. Uh, so, yeah, we, you know, it's it's a jerking start motor which is not firing up. You have to open it up seamlessly. Number two, let me give you, let me elaborate on what I say. When you say in Maharashtra, the shopping malls are open. I said the shopping malls are open, but the theaters and restaurants are not open in the shopping mall. And let us understand that 85 to 90 percent of people go to a mall to watch a movie and eat something and shop on the way out. They don't shop on the way, they don't go to a mall to shop and hope to see a movie. So unless you don't open up, you know, the, the thing in totality, they coexist. And if you think people are going to go to malls today because they want to shop, it's a lot of impulsive shopping that happens in, happens in malls, and it really happens from the traffic. Therefore, if you go to a mall, you actually see the, the theaters are right at the end because they want that traffic to go in and come out. Hmm. Um, the last time we spoke, Mr. Singhania, you were fairly confident that we would see a V-shaped recovery in demand, uh, that there would be uh, you know, a sort of jump up back to consumption are you seeing that position changing now or are you still hopeful of this big jump up in consumption when things end and i'm putting when things end in air quotes because nobody knows when that end is you see if you take the month of june most industries saw a good recovery in demand but these frequent re uh, repeated lockdowns are causing the problem now if you see most of the wholesale markets are in lockdown cities bombay delhi Chennai, Bangalore, Calcutta. 
And these are very large wholesale markets which are in lockdown. And they really feed the rest of the country. So if you see non-lockdown markets, like uh, tier four, five, six, seven towns, there the demand is pretty good. But your big markets are the, are the, are the class one cities which, which are completely locked down. So unless we don't open it up, again, I repeat, sorry to repeat it, but we have to open up. What is the demand looking like, Mr. Singhania? There is a narrative right now that, uh, you know, Bharat is driving demand, that there is a pickup in rural India. Are you seeing that? Are you seeing a decent return in demand? I understand the point about supply side constraints with, you know, frequent localized lockdowns, etc. But having said that, is there a solid demand out there? Oh, yes. I think in certain sectors, the demand has come back. If you see FMCG, if you see... Even in real estate, to an extent, there is demand. It's just that people are not able to move to go and meet their demands. I mean, if you see the auto component sector, you see the engineering sector, these are sectors that we're at more than. We're seeing reasonably good demand. It's a, it's a question of sentiment that if I go out, will I get stopped on the road? Will I get questioned? You know, and I think, you know, I genuinely believe the day we stop talking about coronavirus, coronavirus will be over because, you know, let's talk about the virus for a minute. I mean, if you see the antibody testing that they have done, which is actually a true indicator of how many people have got coronavirus, in Delhi it was 23%, in Bombay it was 44%. That means that 44% of the people on the sample set have actually got coronavirus. And then if you see the percentage of asymptomatic people, with the people that actually have had fatality, that ratio looks even better because there are many, many more people that have got coronavirus that you didn't know. So the denominator is is vastly larger people are going to get it you're either going to get it today or tomorrow and 99.9 percent .9 of people are going to get it uh, in a you know probably in an asymptomatic manner manner why do i say this i mean there's so many buildings that you see today who do testing i was hearing of a building today where the security was tested in the building and the staff was tested 40 people had coronavirus all asymptomatic. It's only because they tested that they got to know. Had they tested after 10 days, those people would have been on the on the other side of the fence. So yeah, I think a very large number of people in the world have got it, they don't even know they've got it, and that's your scene in the antibody testing. So yeah, I mean, we are making, I think at some point, we are making a much larger deal about coronavirus than actually it is. You know, that's that's an interesting take uh, you have there, Mr. Singhania, and uh, may I say a slightly controversial one, because even in best case scenario like Mumbai, if over 40 percent uh, people have coronavirus antibodies, you still have 60 percent who don't. Are you suggesting that uh, governments sort of, you know, open up everything and let's see what happens in a bit to build? Yeah, but you see, what, what, if, that if be, you see, uh, dangerous, we may lose a lot of people. No, so Tamara, let me let me tell you something. The people you are going to lose is for real. Okay, so the people that you have unfortunately lost is for real. You are only multiplying from the known reported cases. There's a very large unknown reported number of cases. So therefore, your fatality rate percentage comes down significantly. Number two, the people who are getting it and are asymptomatic are getting it irrespective whether you're in lockdown or you're not in lockdown. Now, let me give you one of my favorite examples. Let's look at Dharavi. Dharavi has four, five lakh people in Dharavi. The reported cases out of Dharavi is only 3,800. And today you're reporting one or two cases from Dharavi a day. Has coronavirus decided to go away? But if you actually do an antibody test there, and if I'm not mistaken, Dharavi is showing 57% of people have got antibodies. So therefore your percentage of fatality, sorry? Yes. Your percentage of fatality rate is far lower. So it, it is going through. Why is it that in Europe, in France, in Italy, in Spain, okay, there is some resurgence, but most of these places is gone. People, people have got it. But then let me give you the example of Japan, just, just to, you know, flesh out this argument a little bit, Mr. Singhania, because this is an interesting one that a lot of people are having right now across business, I think, in everyone's homes as well. In Japan, they decided not to lock down the economy and, uh, you know, have social distancing and those measures uh, itself. 
um, they are paying the price for it now. They suddenly yeah, find themselves in an overwhelming situation that they can't quite handle. I think, firstly, India has got a much lesser of the strain of the virus. Number two, I was talking to a doctor yesterday, and I said, tell me, doc, how do you get coronavirus? He says two things. One, don't touch the inside of your mask. Because if you have a virus, you put it on the inside of your mask and you take it into your face. Number two, he says, keep your hands clean all the time. Now, there may be certain cases like Japan where it might have gone up exponentially. I am not an expert to answer that question, but let's look at a large part of the world. You know, what? A, if you actually look at the numbers, and I'm not belittling, belittling the situation at any cost, so please don't misunderstand me, but 700,000 people have died, unfortunately, with coronavirus so far. Out of that, almost 600,000 plus people would be over the age of 60. So one of my recommendations to government have been that open it up for people that are below 60 and above 10. And the people who are high risk category, which is over 60, keep them at home. There's no problem. Let them sit at home because they're high risk. But don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. Let me contextualize this conversation, uh, you know, with the India Revival Mission, where we are constantly looking at what India needs to do to not just survive, but also thrive. Our, our numbers are growing exponentially. So then there's that, uh, that, you know, uh, we are, because of being a large population, we have high numbers of positive cases. On the other hand, we want to get businesses on, we want to protect livelihoods as well. What do you think are the two or three things the government must focus on? One of them presumably being easing up lockdowns all around and letting people out? Yeah, I think genuinely, I, you know, I've been a very big advocate. You have to open up because unless you don't open up, business will not happen. Number two, this, I mean, we're looking at what, a million and a half cases in India, two million cases so far. Are we going to get wait till 1.3 billion people get this? The chances are half of India has already got it. We don't know. And if we say, no, we want to officially know that 1.3 people, billion people have got it and then we open up, we won't have anything to open up. Look at so many sectors that are, that are really reeling under the pressure of this. And eventually, this is going to land up on the la uh, on, on the banks, and which will have its own impact across the country. There are enough people. So, for you know, I always say, is the glass half full or half empty? And there are fifty percent of the fifty percent of the people today, if I took a conservative number, are ready to go back to work. A migrant worker is is, is taking a very tough choice: that do I feed myself or do I get scared of coronavirus? How can you take that right away from him? to feed himself. He's willing to work, he's willing to take the risk, whatever that risk percentage is, but he's still willing to take it. How do we stop a person like that from earning a livelihood? Um, let me come back to the context of uh, uh, the company, uh, of you know uh, Raymond, uh, Mr. Singhania. So now there have been some tough decisions you've had to take in terms of letting people go, in terms of cutting costs. And it's also uh, a time when any kind of demand for suiting, formal clothing, picks up during festive season, may be muted this year. What is the outlook looking like for you? What is the kind of pivoting or reinventing you have had to do? So let me just answer one more point on what, uh, what, I, what you asked earlier, and I will answer this question of yours. And, uh, you know, you so said, what can the government do? I mean, I'm a strong advocate, and I told a couple yes. of office bearers, I said that, you know what, we need to kickstart our economy, okay? Keep the IPL in India. Do it in a bubble. Do it between three cities. Do it in a controlled way and kickstart our economy. Why do we need to do it in Dubai? There's absolutely no reason for it. I mean, I'm sure our government can come up with a system. I mean, if you take Bombay, you do it at the Wankhede and you stay at the Oberoi. Why not? You can do it very easily in a bubble. Why do we have to do it in another country and why do we have to kickstart their economy? Is our, the need of the hour is to kickstart our economy. And, you know, we need to stay, we've, you know, as a country, we, we, we should stay away from Chinese products. There's a lot of resentment against Chinese. 
Okay. Uh, you know, I will repeat my other question again, but I must yeah. follow up on this, Mr. Singhania. So you are saying you're disappointed the, by the fact that IPL was taken out of India and now in the UAE, this could have been an opportunity uh, to really kickstart the economy. You, you've got to find another option. When there's so much hatred and resentment against Chinese and for what they have done to the world, are we saying money overrides everything? I'm sorry, this is my personal view. And a lot of people might not like what I say. But as far as bringing the IPL to India, keep it in India. Why can we as a country not work out a system to do it in a bubble? If you see Formula One today, Formula One is doing Formula One in a bubble. Let's learn something from them. And they're doing it across seven or eight countries. It will certainly be easier to do it within one country in India. Why can't we do it? And that will give so many more jobs, create so much of a positive sentiment that our country so needs. Hmm. I think that's a very interesting point. Uh, let me come now to the question of Raymond and the sector. Uh, hmm? You know, and it's, it's a big job creator. Textiles is a huge uh, job creation, uh, you know, uh, sort of fulcrum. Um, big export uh, potential as well, especially in the context of what's happening with China, etc. But for a while, it's been the case that Bangladesh and Vietnam are taking away that gravy train completely. Do you think we need to seriously give a thought on how we can boost the sector, especially at this point? Absolutely. I mean, there's no reason why we should not be the clothiers to the world. I've said it for years, we should definitely be. And there are many issues that we have got. I mean, in Bangladesh, uh, there's a huge support to this industry. Um, even even in, in, the, in the pandemic, they, they, the, the textile industry was given a massive package. Now, I think globally, companies look at India, Raymond as a large export, but how do we make ourselves more competitive? It's not my job to write that paper, but somebody really needs to do an analysis. And you take Vietnam, you take Bangladesh, you take India and see where we are competitive and where we are not. And then write out a white paper and say, this is what we need to do. But I think one of the most important things that uh, needs serious revision are the labor laws in this country. An attempt is uh, being made. I mean, they've, they've uh, you know, reduced the labor laws into four buckets. Uh, every state is doing its own thing. You've had some states who have gone to the extent where people are now calling the changes draconian uh, and anti-labor. Uh, you think that effort is lacking or is it not enough, especially when it's coming from various states? See, firstly, you should have one unified policy for the country. Number two, I just said labor is one of the issues. We need to make a proper white paper on what are all the issues. Because in, in Marwari, we say, boon, boon se gada hai. So you have to, you know, every drop fills a, a bucket. And we have to look at all the issues that are concerned and then try and understand where we are lacking. Okay. Let me come back to the Chinese question. And uh, that's a very important point that you raised, Mr. Singhania, because right now we are seeing... Um, quite a mix of responses to the situation with China. On the one hand, you have a, a ban on apps, and then there are um, government policies which are aimed at incentivizing local business, reducing dependence on China. On the other hand, you have calls for bans, etc. How feasible do you think it is for India to cut out the Chinese influence? Because many also believe that doing so will harm us, especially for intermediary products. You know, I've been saying, see, nothing is going to happen overnight. It'll take its time. It's a mindset. And then if your mind, if you decide that you want to do it, you'll find a way. I generally, you know, I don't, you know, I, let me give you an example. I ordered two T-shirts on the internet. I wanted some T-shirt. It came, then I asked, where is the T-shirt? And they said, it's stuck in the customs because, so I said, it's taken so long. Why is it taken so long? He said, because it's come from China. I said, tell them to keep it. I don't want it. And that, you know, we are sitting on a, on a sentiment where people are anti-China. This is a big opportunity for India. I also believe that if you're Indian, be Indian, buy Indian. In this time, the world looks at India as a market. 
let's support Indian entrepreneurship, let's support Indian people, let's buy Indian products. And I'm sure each, you know, like they say, each one teach one, each one help one. And if you do that, we can really get ourselves out of the problem that we're in. You know, the flip side to that is that a lot of Indians now have access to cheaper goods that they can truly afford. And a lot of Indian businesses, smaller businesses and medium businesses as well, depend on those intermediate products to move ahead. Can we really cut that tap all of a sudden? I did not say cut it all of a sudden. I said it's going to be a process and a matter of time. I mean, you cannot cut it overnight. Having said that, you have to identify what is short term, what is medium term, what is long term, and we should build up our own capabilities. Having said that, I'm saying, where is an intermediate tree? You've got to differentiate between an intermediate tree, which is an essential item, with a, with a, a product which is a non-essential item, which is a, you know eventually final consumer product. People of our industry in the textile business, the amount of fabrics that come from China, which are wrongly declared, they have missed campaign, they're wrongly declared, they are substandard products, they say wool when they're actually polyester, it is actually cheating of the Indian consumer. And we should really be very tough on them and not permit them to come in. And this is happening across sectors. It's not only in the textile sector where large scale misdeclaration is going on. Do you think Indian business needs now protectionist policies instead of uh, being able to compete on a global stage? I don't think we need protectionist policies because that will go against the WTO. I think we need a nationalist sentiment. Let me to the, come to the question of uh, the Raymond Group, uh, Mr. Singhania. Where do you find yourself at this point in a business which, you know, is a discretionary spend at the end of the day? Uh, do you think that this is going to be a time for tough decisions for you? And how do you see your business surviving and thriving? So, you know, I think the times are tough and we've got to also tighten our belts. We've got to, we've got to brace the environment. You've got to take some tough decisions and, you know, eventually you have to see the finish line, uh, which, is, which is pretty far, but, you, you know, you've got to stay focused, stay in the fight. And like they say, tough times pass and tough men last. So you just got to, you've got to deal with it. You don't have a choice. Uh, uh, losing is not an option. Quitting is not an option. Detail. Sure, but what is the strategy, sir? If you could go into a little more detail. No, I think you've got to, you've got to manage your costs. You've got to manage different ways of doing business. You've got to find different ways to reach the consumer. I think the whole online platform is something that you've got to look at. So there are multiple strategies you have to follow. You've got to look at different markets for your products. So it's a, it's a combination of many things. All right. Uh, I'll just end with this question, uh, Mr. Singhania. How optimistic are you feeling right now, given the current situation and knowing that perhaps we are, you know, going to see a vaccine uh, early 2021? Uh, has that given you some kind of, uh, a, you know, a flight path to what is coming next? See, you know, I'm an eternal optimist. And I always believe night follows day and day follows night. You know, this is the moment that you live in, and you live in the present, and this too shall pass. So I'm an optimist. You deal with today, and we'll worry about tomorrow, tomorrow. And I believe this is not here forever. I genuinely believe a lot more people have got the virus than, than people. And I, I, you know, somebody asked me one day, when will this end? And I said, it'll end the day the media stops talking about it. Because the re world is ready to move on. Those who are scared, please stay at home. There are 90% oh. of people who want to move off. Absolutely, Mr. Singhania. But I don't think the media or any responsible media can stop reporting on the coronavirus. Uh, but thank you so much. No, I, so I'm much not saying don't report. I'm not saying don't report. But it is the only thing you see today. That's the unfortunate part. Here at ET Now, we're also telling you how you can look ahead and revive. Uh, so I hope that adds value to all of our viewers. Thank you once again, Mr. Singhania, for speaking with us. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye.